Hi, my name is Christian de Schriever. I'm a senior member in the customized high performance computing team at the University of Kaiserslautern here in Germany. In this video, I'm going to talk about some basic concepts regarding design space, design space exploration, and some basic terms related to the topic. Assume you as a system designer are given a task, design a specific system for me. Of course, at the very beginning, a lot of things will be unclear. This is why, in general, you will receive a specification. In the most general case, it's a requirement specification that tells you what the system is all about. There are two types of requirements. One are functional requirements that specify the behavior of the system. That means the inputs, the outputs, and everything what is happening in between the inputs and the output. That means um, changing the behavior of the system would change the functional aspect of the system. Therefore, those criteria are called functional criteria. Besides the functional specification, you also have non-functional points. That are all criteria that can influence the system, but are not directly related to the behavior. Non-functional criteria can have a huge impact on the system design, of course, and we will have a look at that later. Besides the requirements, more things might influence the decisions that you take in the system design process. <coughs> this is what we call constraints. Constraints can be imposed either by yourself, by your company, by your boss, or by the customer. Constraints are restrictions that can come from everywhere and that influence your design flow. Let's consider one example, a system that generates random numbers. There are many ways for generating random numbers. For example, you could just throw a dice, you could flip a coin, or you could use an elaborate electronic system that does the job for you. So at the very first step in the design process, it is not really clear which decision to take. You see, it can be either a mechanical or an electrical system, and that of course has a huge impact on the later process where the design is refined. This is why we first need the specification. The specification tells us, okay, in this case, we want to have a specific distribution, a uniform distribution of the random numbers, and other functional specifications are for example, the output range, what is the representation of the numbers, what is the required quality. That are all things that influence directly the behavior of the system itself. Non-functional specification could be the user interface, so how is the system going to be used later on, robustness, throughput, and many, many more points. Constraints in general can have a big impact on how you will proceed during the design process. But even with all those things fixed, specification and constraints, you go back to your office, sit down at your desk, and what you are seeing is this. This is a space of all solutions that you can observe and that are instantly popping up to your mind. This is what we call the design space. The design space covers all possible solutions to a problem, and yeah, we can see it really as a space looking up to the sky and seeing a lot of stars where each star reflects one solution. And this is in the end a single point in the design space. The question is now how can we find the solution that we want to have for our system in the end. So we start navigating through the space, we walk around, we have a look here, have a look there and the question is now and this is the big challenge in system design, what is the best strategy for navigating through the design space. Because whenever you change the viewpoint, you get quite a different view on the space. For example, here we see two solutions very, very big instantly in front of us, but the optimal solution might not necessarily be there. And this process is called design space exploration. Design space exploration means cutting away solutions that we don't want to consider, open up new fields of solutions that we have not seen before, and navigating through the design space in a way so that we can find the solution we are looking for. And this, and this is very important, needs to be done in a reasonable time frame. Because you can imagine with increasing system complexity, also the number of available solutions will be really, really exploding, and therefore it's very important to have good strategies for that. 
The optimal solution could for example be located here, so we are quite close, and then we take it, pick it, and our problem is solved. In general, the design space has a lot of dimensions. A dimension is a single parameter that can be modified. And of course, there are many, many parameters in systems that can be modified. Let me give you a few examples. One is the model that is underlying the problem. I will talk about that in a few minutes in detail. In general, the model is a formal abstraction of the problem and it has a very, very big influence on the remaining process that we carry out when designing a system. The algorithm that we select later on, that means the type and the parameters of the algorithm, also have a big influence on future optimization strategies that we can perform. Then we have decisions that need to be done regarding the implementation. For example, which execution platform we take or which data types we take. What is the representation of the data in our system in every step? That means the design space really can explode here. We have a lot of decisions to be done regarding memory types, hierarchy, communications and all those related things. But also non-functional specifications or non-functional decisions that we need to take. For example, what are the performance metrics of our system? Specific design decisions can have a big impact on those metrics. For example, a serial implementation is of course slower but more area efficient than a fully parallel implementation. Regarding the requirements we have reg uh, with respect to throughput, latency, energy consumption, we will end up with different system designs here in the end. Flexibility is very important and flexibility, as you might have experienced on your own, is a key to know about flexibility right at the beginning when you start a design process because an optimized solution will always be very efficient with very high throughput, with very low energy, but of course it's not flexible. If you extend your range of application later on, it will cost you a lot of effort to re-engineer your system to add those flexibility again. Maintainability also can have a huge impact on your system design process and also quality of results and there are many many more functional and non-functional dimensions that span up the complete design space in the end. We can consider this as some kind of abstract process when we move through the design space and this is helpful to a little bit separate between different terms. Therefore let me propose a strategy how we introduce abstraction when navigating through the design space. In the very beginning, we have a problem that we want to solve with the system. In our case, this problem is random number generation. The first step we take is we abstract a model for generating those random numbers. A model could be, for example, the type of random numbers that we have, and I will explain that in a few minutes. Then we perform the actual design space exploration, we find a solution. The solution itself consists of the algorithm, in this case a Mersenne twister 19.937 and the implementation of this algorithm. That could be for example in dedicated hardware. And it's very important to really exploit all the degrees of freedom you have during the design space navigation, design space exploration and to come up with a custom design in the end and a matching system that both considers hardware and algorithmic aspects to do this in a co-design way. That means we are always looking at algorithm and implementation at the same time. Once the solution is there, we can execute it. We can execute the implementation of the solution. Then it evaluates our model and from the model we get a representation of the results. That means we need to interpret the model results to get the answer to our problem itself. So what does the term models mean in this context? Assume your system has the task to generate random numbers. What we can see are three basic ways for generating random numbers that fundamentally differ. And this is the type of random numbers we are talking about. For example, you can generate quasi-random numbers with a deterministic approach and these quasi-random numbers have the nice effect that they are not random at all. Their purpose is to generate a grid in a multidimensional space that covers the space in a, let's say, nearly equal way 
with some tuning that you can perform. But they are constructed very deterministically and their goal is not to be random at all, but they can be very helpful for scientific simulations and numerical evaluations. A second type of random numbers is what we call really random numbers, so true randomness. And then random numbers generated in general from physical processes. For example, you can get random numbers of those type from random.org. You can generate them by implementing your own physical experiment that you are evaluating every time. And this should be really random. Drawback, this is not reproducible. Advantage, it is not reproducible, therefore it's really random. However, for scientific simulations, Pseudo-random numbers are generated in a deterministic way, but with the intention to look random in the end. That means when you look at a not that good pseudo-random number generated, as in this image here, you can see that there's a structure inside. And this structure is obvious. This is not a random pattern, and therefore we expect that there will be some deterministic creation process behind. The model as I said, can have a huge impact on the remaining design space exploration process because depending on the type of random numbers, you will have completely different approaches how your system looks like and how you will continue when you design your system and your future decisions. This slide shows some examples for dimensions that we have in the design space of a random number generation system. So over there we have the most important thing, this is the model. The model determines what kind of type of random numbers do I select. And this, of course, have a, has a big influence on the remaining design process. We have dimensions that are related to the algorithm, for example, the type of algorithm. How can I set the seeds? What is the feedback depth? And so on. We have implementation related dimensions. That means everything related to the implementation of the algorithm like the compute platform, the state storage, interfacing, and all those technical details. And we have the non-functional dimensions related to the quality, area, the code size, energy consumption, throughput, and so on. So the next time when you look at your system and you see something like this, I hope this video helps you to get a little bit more structure in the design process and to navigate a little bit more in a systematic way so that you will end up with this position very soon and find your final solution in a very short amount of time. Thank you for watching.